Richard Gerber has been a de described as one of the most inspirational leaders of his generation. He argues, however, that great leadership is about serving the needs of the people that work for you and rely upon you. The three core principles that underpin Gerber's philosophy are communication, empowerment, and impact. His insights into change, leadership, and education are unique thanks to his own extraordinary journey, which has seen him go from being a struggling actor, copywriter, estate agent, to becoming an award-winning teacher and school principal, whose groundbreaking work in education was celebrated by the British National Teaching Awards and UNESCO, amongst others. On leaving his 20-year career in education, he's worked to explore the links between great leadership, human potential, change, and innovation. Whatever sector Gerber works in, his principles remain the same. Organizations need to remember that systems and structures change nothing. People do. And that to ensure that we get the best from those we work with and lead and serve, we must be committed to developing the communication, understanding, and actions that lead to a culture of empowerment resulting in long-term demonstrable impact. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm music education welcome to our keynote speaker, Mr. Richard Gerber. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, do, you don't want to clap too hard at the beginning because I might be rubbish and you can't take a clap back, can you? Um, <laughs> I need to start with a couple of apologies. Um, I don't know how many of you can see uh, my footwear. Now, my daughter would be really proud of my suit uh, suede trainer combo this morning. Uh, my wife would be devastated. Um, and at this point, as a precursor to everything I'm going to say to you this morning, you might want to walk out now because who's going to trust a guy that thought he'd packed a pair of suit dress shoes in his bag to find out he had two left ones this morning? Um, <laughs> I know, yeah, rock and roll. But the thing is, it's okay because I saw what people were wearing last night in the lobbies of the Marriott and the Hilton. So frankly, I feel totally appropriate this morning. Um, the second, the second thing, did you see that guy with the blood pouring out of his face last night? I wanted to call first aid. Um, the second thing I want to apologize for this morning, and this is far more important really, is that I am not uh, a musician to the eternal sadness of my life. You know, it's one of those things that is definitely on my list that I need to... I was listening to those extraordinary young people this morning. Weren't they unbelievable? <laughs> Music education at its finest. And I, I was thinking to myself, I want to be able to do that. So who knows, I might try. Now, the thing is, I do come from a family of musicians. My wife is a musician. Uh, my daughter and son uh, are both studying music. And my mother uh, is a musician. In fact, her claim to fame is she wrote her wedding march, her own wedding march, and also her first dance. Now, I have to tell you that the music has lasted a lot longer than her marriage. <laughs> I know. Was that too much? I don't know. Um, so it's genuinely, it's an incredible privilege to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for coming out on a Sunday. Thank you for coming out on a Sunday early in the morning. Um, I feel honored to be here. I feel honored to be part of what is truly an extraordinary... I'd never been to the NAMM show before. This place has blown my mind. Um, it's, it's quite extraordinary. To be part of the foundation with you here is incredible. To have met so many unbelievable advocates of music and arts education over the last couple of days. It was my great privilege last night to go out for dinner with many of them, including my great friend uh, Bob Morrison, um, who I just wanted to, to mention here because he's one of my heroes. You know, he's one of those people who's kind of passionate and belief in the importance of music education is one of the reasons why I think right 
rightly, we are going to keep this alive, and it should be at the heart of the future of everything that we debate around education. And I guess that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Um, it's also quite a kick for me to be here, by the way, because when I started my job as a school principal, I will never forget the day. It was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. I had been appointed to take on uh, what was apparently the worst school in the United Kingdom. The government had felt it was so lousy that they were going to shut it down. Uh, now, apparently, the only person in the entire United Kingdom that didn't know about this plan was me. Um, which was why, if I'm honest with you, I ended up as the school principal. I was the only candidate. Uh, and the fact that I was breathing, I think, gave me the job. Um, so I took over this school, and I remember, and I was young, right? I was 31 when I got my principal's position. And I walked into my first staff meeting, and you'll all recognize moments like this. It was a room filled with people who were all, had all been at one time in their lives passionate educators. And I say that very deliberately, had at one time in their lives been passionate educators. Most of them now were shells of the people they were, those young people that had chosen to be in what I think is the most important job in society, right? So I walked into a room, and you know what people are like when they feel down on themselves. Some of them are skeptical, some of them are angry, some of them are unionized, and I walked into a room full of people I can only describe to you as wasp swallowers. You know that pose, you know those, teachers are brilliant at this. It's lucky I can't see you now, the spotlights. I just, but you, we assume a position as educators. We kind of go. <laughs> so my room was for, there were 100 people in this room sat there like this. And I walked in, and I knew, by the way, they were taking bets on how long this school principal would last, because they were proud of the fact they'd seen off eight in 10 years, right? So I walked in, and they were already taking bets. There was a sweepstake on how long I'd last, right? And they're all sat there, and they're all expecting me to say the usual stuff about, we've got to get our grades up, we've got to improve our exam results, da di da di da And I think, in the moment, if I'm honest, it wasn't brilliance or wisdom, I froze. And I stood there, and the only thing that came out of my mouth, and the, to this day, it really, I'm proud of it, because it was an instinctive thing. I stood there and I said, how are we going to turn our school into Disneyland? Little did I know that all these years later, I'd be talking to you in Disneyland. Right? Now, I'll tell you a bit about what I mean by that. For me, education, and I'm passionate about this, education for me should be something that every child wants to be involved in, that every child should queue up for, that every child should be desperate to be part of. You know, in the same way that kids cannot wait, wherever they are in the world, the idea of going to Disneyland is one of those incredible things. I mean, adults on the whole, parents dread it. Kids love it, right? And the really interesting thing for me is the paradigm question, which is this. Disneyland, in many ways, isn't that magical, because you have to queue for hours to get on a ride that lasts three minutes, right? And usually, in bloody hot weather, okay? So, what always amazes me is at Disneyland, have you noticed this? It's never the children who are tantruming. It's always the parents. The parents are the one going, oh, please, let's go and have something to eat now. No more queuing. The kids come off a ride, having queued for an hour to go on it, and the first thing they say is, can we queue again? Now, the interesting thing for me about that, like education, is education isn't always just going to be roses. It's not always just going to be joy and fun and excitement and Mickey Mouse. But what is it about the cultural experience for young people at a place like Disneyland that makes them want to queue up and do the hard stuff? Because at the end of each time they go on that journey, there's something extraordinary that's happening. And I suppose that's where I want to reflect on a little bit with you in the next few minutes. As I said, I can't tell you about music education, but what I can do is tell you about my views on education. And the thing is, you're remarkable, professional, passionate, committed people in this room. 
And what I ask you to do is translate some of the big vision and thinking that I'm about to share with you and put it into your context. Because you see, for me, one of the challenges for us in arts education is to get those hopeless, what word can I use so I don't get thrown out of here for swearing? Policy makers, that's the word we'll use. Those people who seem to define the way our children should be educated, to understand that education is not about delivery of content or preparing children to take tests. It's about helping develop and empower them so they don't just survive in their lives, but they thrive there. And that's something we all have to be involved in. And most importantly for me, those people, those young people who are going to make it, and here's a thought for you. We've got to stop talking about the 21st century like it's some time yet to come. Kids being born now are going to be living in the 22nd century. So what we need to do is understand, and it's always been the case in human history, the happiest people are people that have developed as human beings, that know how to communicate, interact, celebrate, innovate. Those are the things that make, make and define success. And those are the things that are at the very heart of arts education. So let me share with you the three words that kind of define my vision for what education should be. And, and I hope some of it will resonate with you. So the first and most important thing for me, the reason I eventually became an educator, was because I passionately believe that our role is to help our children celebrate the potential of their own lives in every facet. I want to be an educator because I want to empower young people. I want them to raise their heads above the parapet and see the potential of who and what they can be. And I don't care what their socioeconomic background is or whether, where they're educated. That, to me, is a fundamental thing. And it reminded me, as I was preparing to, to come and talk to you today, it reminded me of an inspirational story I remember reading many years ago. Remember the progressive educator John Holt? You remember, I don't know if you've heard this story, when he retired, his wife knew that he had one profound regret through most of his life, and that was that he'd never learned to play a musical instrument. And the musical instrument, it turns out, John had been desperate to learn to play for most of his life, was the cello. I, I don't know, I'm not a musician, but I, you know. So he said well, that was the thing, right? And so his wife, as a surprise for him on his retirement, found a local music educator and bought him some lessons. So he started learning to play the cello. And he was loving it. And after a few weeks, he went over to his music teacher's house and they sat down and they had a cup of coffee together and they were talking about his progress and what maybe where they should go next. And um, at one point, his music teacher said, have you got anything you'd like to ask me in particular, John? He said, well, just one, just one question. He said, for a number of months now, and he broke into a smile. He said, for a number of months now, I've been telling my friends that I'm learning to play the cello. He said, when can I tell them I'm playing the cello? <laughs> a lovely thought, because to me, that's one of the great challenges of education. For most of our young people, whatever it is they're learning in, whatever context, it occurs to me that most young people think that learning and education is something they do to earn the right to become a proper person. It's almost like a Catholic view of purgatory. It's something we have to go through. I mean, let's, come on, let's, how many of you are parents? How many of you are parents? Can you speak? Yeah, me too. By the way, how many of you have, um, have, or have, more importantly, have survived having teenagers at home? Yeah. By the way, I've got two at home. It's why I travel. Um, but, <laughs> but the point is, it isn't, is it? It's not like childhood should be a preparation for real life. So education has to matter for the now. It has to matter for the moment. Which brings me on to my second word, which is learning. And no one, no one can argue that learning isn't the greatest gift that any civilized society can bestow on its young people. But I'm not entirely sure for a lot of our young people, their experience of education feels that way. 
I remember reading an incredible book which I found in about 2001, 2002. It was written in the millennium. And it was a book called The School I'd Like. And it was a collection of research interviews that two professors of education, Catherine Burke and Ian Grosvenor, two UK professors of education, had collected over a number of years when interviewing groups of young people between the ages of three and 18. And the book's brilliant because it's basically just filled with quotes from young people and their insights into education on the premise of what would your ideal school be like. And one young woman, one young woman from a very socially deprived community in the UK, who at the time was 16 years of age, her name's Kirsty, and she was asked that question, and her response, I think, was one of the most provocative, powerful, and profound things I've ever heard as a critique for education. And she said this, when I read it for the first time, it was like a punch in my gut. She said this, in my ideal world, we will no longer be treated like a herd of an identical wild animal waiting to be civilized for the outside world. You will realize and respect that it's my world too. And I wonder sometimes and I worry that too much of education feels that way. But that is where music education has so much power and resonance. Because at the heart of music education is the development of individuals, their passions, their interests, and their talents. And that, for me, is one of the true reasons why music education and arts education has to be at the very core of what we offer young people. Because whatever the complexity of what's happening politically around the world in education. Through arts education and music education, we have always, always at our heart celebrated the uniqueness of the individual. Which brings me on to my third word. And my third word isn't clever and I don't have a fancy story for you, but it's laughing. You know, one of the things that really upsets me about education, and we know it's a serious business, is whenever people talk about it, they kind of put on that serious face. You know, like when we're having a proper chat with our children, we put on that, oh, no, education. We'll see it with politicians. We've got our general election coming up in the UK in May, and what will happen is, the minute anyone mentions education, they put on their serious face. <laughs> Education's a very serious matter. Very serious. And then you wonder why young people are going, I don't care. It's got to be fun, isn't it? It's got to matter. Anything in life that resonates, anything that you become passionate about is not something you're told to do or told to do for abstract reasons that you have no concept of. It's because it brings you joy in the moment. It makes your heart beat faster. Sometimes it brings you to tears. It challenges you, but it makes you feel alive. And you know, for me, as I walk around, the celebration that is NAM, that primal feeling is extraordinary. You can't help but feel alive. Music does that to us. Looking at the magic of the young people stood up here a few minutes ago and the glint in their eye as they were making something important in the moment for now. That was special, don't you think? And partly the problem is this. We are so submerged in education under a culture of what I call the silver bullet. We're under so much pressure as educators that all the time we're waiting for somebody to come along and give us the answer, to give us permission, to give us the thing we should do. And you look at the endless policy in education and the ridiculous names that policymakers give some of these things that they've been working on. We've had hundreds in the UK in the last 15 years. We've had over 700 federal government-driven initiatives in elementary school education alone. My favorite of them and you know what it's like, don't you? Some 21-year-old who sits in an office at the height of power thinks they're being really clever when they come up with a catchphrase. It's like a game show education policy design, I think. Come on down, right? My favorite in the UK in recent years was one they called Every Child Matters. Well, thank God they told me, because... Uh, 
because until then, I only ever taught the middle class kids with nice haircuts. Uh, so, so there you are. We had another one, which was called Excellence and Enjoyment. And I remember being at a political debate with a government minister over this. And somebody said, well, when are we supposed to fit that in? this new policy, on top of everything else we're already doing. And this minister, this is true, said, well, have you got space in your timetable? For example, Thursday afternoon. And I'm thinking, well, if you only do excellence and enjoyment on a Thursday afternoon, what happens the rest of the week? <laughs> OK, kids, mediocrity Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday morning. I'm back to that on Friday, but on Thursday afternoon, boy, we are going to fly to start, right? What nonsense. And the problem with the way we think about the future of anything when we're trying to improve it is so driven by our experience and education. Let me show you what I mean. Because we come from an industrial mindset, right? I don't know how many of you have seen this image before. This is a fishing village, I believe, in the north of Scotland. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see a man stood on a van that is upturned and sinking. Now, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but there is a pub, a bar, just in the corner. You can't see it. Now, if the two things are linked, who knows? But it's a possibility, right? <laughs> the interesting thing about this image, I want to talk you through it, is this. First of all, have you noticed that whenever there seems to be a physical problem in the world, and I'm talking to the, the women in the audience here, have you noticed that men seem to think that physical problems are their domain? It's like men come alive at a physical problem. Our testosterone clicks in, and we kind of stand there and go, OK, <laughs> leave this to me. It's like, because we don't have to leave our caves and hunt wild animals anymore, this is what's primal for men. And what happens is we gather as men to solve physical problems, and we assume man physical problem-solving position. <laughs> and if you look, that's exactly, so can we bring them in? That's exactly what these guys are doing. Now, luckily for them, there is a crane on the quayside because it's used usually to haul the fish from the water, right? So these men, not unreasonably, have gone, we need to use the crane to lift the van out of the water. And then we shall go back to the bar where we shall celebrate our manly genius with our little ladies. This is what's happening. And they're all smug, and everything's going marvelously. Have a look at this. Look. Now, one of the things you need to notice about this picture is nothing attracts men to more men uh, other than success. Look how many more men there are now on the quayside. And they've, they've changed from man problem solving position to man problem solved position. Right now, it's the Superman look. And they're all so smug and so happy. And they're about to go back to the bar and celebrate their genius until this happens. <laughs> now, what you have to notice about this image <laughs> is all the men have run away. <laughs> Including the dog, who's a boy dog. He's running in the opposite direction, too, right? Men do that, don't they? Well, I don't know. It wasn't my idea. It was Bar Barry. Barry thought of that one. Idiot. Right, but then they reassemble because this is the way we're educated, you see. When there's a problem, when something fails, what we're educated to believe is if something doesn't work, it's because we didn't try hard enough. Think about our own lives. Think about the people you know who work every day. How many times do you hear that rubbish from people where they compete with one another to prove how much they care and how hard they're working by telling you how many hours in the week they work, how many weekends they give up to do their job, how many evenings? How many times do you hear people say to children, well, it's no wonder you didn't pass, you just weren't working hard enough, which is interesting because this is how we grow into adulthood and the way we believe. If something not working, the first instinct is because is we, we weren't trying hard enough. So these men regather, you see. Now, I have no idea how they got hold of this, but they obviously decided that the reason for their failure was because they didn't have a big enough crane. 
I think you'll find what we needed was a bigger crane. Right. Now, the tragedy of this set of slides is that I don't even need to show you the last image to know how this story ends. So think about education for a minute, right? Think about it all. Think about our place as music educators in all of this, right? The obsession, the obsession is it's not working. We're not as good as China, apparently. Have you noticed that? How much does that annoy you, right? We're not as good as China. We all go, China, China's the place. What are they doing in China? Oh, they're torturing their kids, right? Well, we better torture our kids then. How do they torture the kids? They make them take tests every day. Well, we'll do tests twice a day. What a load of rubbish. <laughs> you, can imagine, you can see it now, can't you? They're sat there in their offices looking at league to, where are we this year? Make them work harder, whip them. So here's what we have to do right now. At this point, I'm very clear about the fact that clearly nobody in this room knew who the hell I was until you rolled in here this morning drawn by the music and you've had to stay because it would have been rude to get up at that point, wouldn't it? But you are actually thinking, come on, I'm only here for another few hours. I want to get down to the show, have a beer, get on the road. But I surround myself with uh, famous friends. That's how I compensate for being nobody. I, I find it helps feed my ego. Um, and this is one of my famous friends. And I know you're looking at this picture now going, he must be mad. We have no idea. Right now, he's a really interesting character. And you might not even know him when I tell you his name. This guy's name is Sebastien Foucault. Now, Sebastien is the founder of parkour, or free running. He is a very groovy guy. As a fat, balding, middle-aged man, I have found myself hanging out with groovy guys. It's like a vicarious thing. Somehow, I hope I, you know, kind of exude cool because I'm with cool people, right? So Seb is very cool. And the problem I have with Seb is he never walks anywhere. So if we're together, he's leaping off buildings like Spider-Man, right? And I'm on the street. But anyway, there he is. Now, the thing about Seb, what makes him really famous? Two things, I guess. One is that, I don't know how many of you have seen that uh, James Bond film, Casino Royale. Just give me your hands. Have you seen Casino Royale with Daniel Craig? Whoa, I know, yeah. You can see the similarity, right? So, <laughs> I think the accent, possibly. So, Daniel Craig in that, if you remember the opening sequence of Casino Royale, Bond is chasing a bad guy over cranes and buildings. That is Sebastian, right? He choreographed that. And here's a thought for you. If ever you watch it again, he used no safety equipment. That was shot as real, right? How cool is that? But the other thing is, he also part choreographed one of Madonna's last world tours. So this is a very groovy guy, okay? So I hang with him. And we were a few, uh, last year, we were doing an event together in a city in Russia called Ekaterinburg. Now, Ekaterinburg is infamous, really, in Russia, because it's the city where the Tsar Tsarina and their children were slaughtered at the end of the Russian Revolution. But it's also a fascinating city. It's one of those cities where you can see the arc of a, of, of a place's history just through the architecture. Stunning, really. So we're walking through the streets of Ekaterinburg, uh, Seb and I. I've got him on a leash so that he can't run over buildings. Um, I mean, we're walking through the streets, and I'm looking at these buildings, right? So you've got the opulent pre-communist architecture, which then arcs into the stark communist architecture, which then arcs into this explosion in new expression and freedom in, in some stunning modern architecture. It's an amazing place. And I'm walking through the city, a bit like a child at a firework display. You know, I'm going, oh, whoa, whoa, oh, right, I'm doing this. And no response from Mr. Foucault next to me. And a one, we get to one building, and I'm beside myself now, because it's the Church of the Blood. Just its name, the child in me loves the idea there's a Church of the Blood, right? And I'm looking at this incredible, and I said to Seb, Seb, isn't this beautiful. And he went, what? I said, the buildings, aren't they increasing? I don't know. I've not been looking at the buildings. 
I said, really? He said, yeah, you know what? Ever since I was a child, he said, I've never really been interested in buildings. He said, when, I, when I'm moving through an urban space, he said, what always fascinates me is the spaces between the buildings. He said, you see, the thing for me is buildings constitute objects. And he said, it's just an inbuilt thing. Ever since I was a young child, what fascinates me is how you get round, above, or under objects. He said, and it strikes me that most people don't see the world that way. He said, let me put it to you another way. He said, it strikes me that most people as they grow start as kind of little stones and become big rocks in a stream. He said, most people lead their lives like this. They go, okay, now I understand the game. I see the, the parameters. I see the rules by which I have to live. And they work out how they're going to play that game. And then they plant themselves in the river. And they go, I'm a rock. And I'm not going to move. And isn't it sad? Because the older we become, how many people do we know who behave this way? You know, change is a really interesting thing because if you're under five, everything about your life is about change. You don't want stability. You don't want the same thing. You want constant challenge and stimulation. It's no accident, is it, that experts will tell us that we learn somewhere between 70 and 75% of everything we learn in our lifetime before we're five years of age. So at that age, we're still kind of tumbling around. And then, sadly, something happens to us where we go, okay, this is my space. We think to ourselves, oh, this is the kind of music I like. I won't like that music, so I'm not going to, I'm not, they're not my kind of thing. And when we go to restaurants, we get to an age where we go, well, I know what I like, and I order the same thing roughly off the menu because I know the kind of food I like. And sadly, even some people get to that point in their life where they go, oh, we, we're not going to make friends with them. They're not our kind of people. We kind of lock stuff down around our lives. It's like the iris in the eye closing down and letting in less and less light. Isn't that a tragedy about the way we lead our lives? That as kids, the world is full of adventure and possibility. And then for most people, the older they become, the more they're planted they become, right? He said, now, that's most people. He said, I like to think of myself as water. He said, because the really interesting thing about water is that you can't stop it. Water will always find a way. He said it will always find a way to flow round, over, under, through the tiniest gaps. It will always find a way. He said, and the real tragedy for rocks is they're stood there for most of the time going, yes, I'm a rock. I'm immovable. But eventually they get eroded away. And one of the things as he was talking to me with the tear of my eye, I mean, amazing guy. He's French, by the way, so only a Frenchman can come out with that kind of poetry, right? And I'm stood there thinking, my God, he's right. And one of the challenges I think that face us on two levels as educators, you see, the really interesting thing is this, and I hear it everywhere I go when I travel around the world. I hear educators, in whatever capacity they teach and educate, say to me, oh, this is what I'd love to do. This is how I'd love to do it. Wouldn't it be brilliant? This is what I want to do, but. And then we're experts at giving all the reasons why stuff can't happen. And then we kind of go, okay, well, I'll live in my misery. I'm a rock. <laughs> Wouldn't it be brilliant, actually, if we started to think a little bit more like water? But here's the real kicker. Here's the challenge for any of us working with young people in education, whatever our capacity. How do we make sure our kids spend their lives thinking as if they're water? How do we make sure that they grow up to believe that their job is to constantly find the space? Now, I share this next slide with you for no other reason. Well, two reasons. One is crass commerciality, right? This was some work I did for my last book. I'm not going to tell you about it because I expect you all to buy it. Um, no, 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 but it would be crass for me to tell you about change, learn to love it, learn to lead it, available on Amazon and all good bookstores. But I, you know, but I wanted to share this with you because as I was looking into this stuff a few years ago for my book, I kind of came across some very interesting research into the traits of greatness. And as I was preparing to speak to you today, thinking about the water and the rock scenario, this apparently, there was some research done into a thousand of the world's most influential people through history, right? And it was looking at the traits they had in common. And I'm not going to read them out to you, but it strikes me 
as I think about this and I thought about preparing today, that those are all behaviors that you see in musicians, musicianship, and great music education, don't you think? So here's one of the big things for me. Music education cannot be marginalized. Music education is at the very heart and the very center and the very core of what education has to be if our kids are not just going to survive but thrive in the 22nd century. And the one at the bottom I've put in red for very good reason. You are extraordinary people, and what brings you here today, and what keeps you doing your job through the obstacles, through all the things that are in your way, is a profound sense of higher purpose. And what I urge you never to do is to lose that sense of higher purpose. Now, I can't believe it. You probably can, but I've run out of time. We're going to have a couple of questions, I think, in a second. So all that's left for me to say is thank you for ignoring my shoes. <laughs> thank you. Can, I'll tell you where I got them later. Thank you for coming this morning. And most importantly, thank you for giving the children that you work with the gift that you do, which is so much more than the beauty of music. Thank you very much indeed.